So thank you for coming today. What, um, what I loved most in the book is how authentic and how vulnerable you were, which I feel like when someone's writing about their life, they don't always want to write about the scary or sad or other parts of it. And I liked that you went there with us in the book. So what, why did you decide to take that kind of route and not make it be all like roses and fairy tales? Roses and fairy tales are not real life, and, and it's boring. Um, it was scary to make the decision to be so open and vulnerable, but I just felt, I feel like it's the only way people relate. And it's something I discovered a long time ago on a spin bike, and I started to talk about personal things up there. I, I wouldn't make it subjective. I would, I would say things in a way that it would apply to everybody, and everyone would immediately relate to what I was saying and get a lot out of it and know that all the challenges that we face every day, we're not alone, that we're all facing them kind of together. What made you <clears throat> ready to write the memoir? So a lot of people throughout the years always would say to me, you know, they would hear my story and they would say, you really need to write a book. And I would just say, oh yeah, you know, <laughs> never thinking it would ever happen. And it really just took one person who said the same thing. And then I said, yeah, yeah. And kind of dismissed it. And he said, no, no, you really need to write a book. And I'm going to introduce you to a literary agent, you know, and basically help pulled me and held my hand and took me to meet this uh, couple, and they are literary agents, and I sat in their living room, and they said, tell me your story, and I did. And by the time I got home, I had a contract in my inbox. Wow. So that's how it happened. And what made you, the way you wrote it, I really liked it. You, you shared personal things, and you also made it about how you started two businesses and all the lessons that you learned in it. Mm -hmm. And then you split it into three parts. What made you, which were... Uh, reinvention, rejuvenation, and rewards. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to break it into these parts and kind of make it a personal thing and also throw in the business aspect and lessons that you learned? I think that, well, first of all, the reinvention piece is a huge part of the story, and um, which is why I devoted a whole section to it, because I have had a lot of um, roadblocks along the way. It was not an easy ride by any means um, to get to uh, being the co-founder of both businesses. But um, I wanted people to know and understand and be inspired because no matter where we are in life, we do all have the ability to reinvent ourselves if we want to. And I started Soul Cycle when I was 48 and I started Flywheel when I was 52. So, you know, a lot of people are shocked at that and they can't even imagine starting a business at those ages. But I wanted to tell the story and let people know that anything's possible. Um, so rejuvenation came from just that, starting over again, starting over again after you've been burned or hurt or um, blindsided and knowing that you can pick yourself up and start again. Um, and what was the last part? Rewards. Rewards. Yes. I mean, obviously for me, it was just about, as I say in the subtitle of the book, it was just about kind of reaping rewards from this career that uh, I made for myself, never ever fathoming that I would be here today. Um, never went to business school, had, didn't have a clue about how to run a business. Um, and really, it just, it literally all came out of following my passion. And you started as a dancer. I did. And then from there, something difficult happened in life, which everyone should read the book. I'm not going to give everything away. <laughs> um, you went through something difficult, and that's kind of how you found spin. Yes. Um, I. It's interesting, because no matter what you do in life, and you know, whether you were a musician or a dancer or anything growing up. And no matter what path your career takes, it's it's so interesting in retrospect what you bring to your career that you might have learned when you were eight years old. And so for me, with we were talking about this today with dancing, I was constantly in a dance class and I saw how um, gratifying it was if the dance teacher said, great job, Ruth, or like beautiful Ruth. And that could just make my entire day. And that's just an example of something that I brought to the spin class because as I said, we were talking about, um, 
if someone says, great job, Charity, that's all you need. And it, it gives you almost a high for the rest of the day. And so that was just one small component of this product that came to be where at the end of the day, people felt better about themselves after 45 minutes. So how does your method different than the, when you started taking spin at was it a Reebok? Reebok the Reebok yeah. Club. Mm -hmm. So is your method kind of the instructor that you fell in love with there that really motivated you and kept you coming back? Or is yes. it you're kind of your own on top of that? Well, it started with the method of the instructor who became my guru. And um, we were also talking about that phenomenon where you go to an exercise class and you just really become obsessed with one instructor. And then I did with this particular instructor. And two years in, he got up in front of the class one day and announced that he was moving to Florida. And I was like, what? Like, how am I going to even continue with my life? And um, that was the moment when I decided I, I was just going to start uh, teaching because I didn't like any of the other instructors. And I had a background, obviously, in dance. And I had uh, taught some group exercise before that. So, um, I, so I started teaching. And then my five years of teaching in Reebok is when I really kind of honed my method and added on to what he taught me and really spent the time observing what people liked, what they didn't like, what they took to, what motivated them. And those were really the formative years of my class. And then from there, you formed Soul Cycle. I did. With um, Elizabeth and Julie. Mm -hmm. And how long did that take from the thought of you guys wanting to have a spin class of your own? Because you noticed that people that were going into Reebok to take spin, we're only taking spin. Exactly. That you wanted to kind of, you guys I feel like were the pioneers of this boutique fitness. Yes. That you wanted to start this. From like when you thought of it, how long did it take to come off the ground? So um, the fall of 2005, Elizabeth uh, approached me, she was a rider in my class, and said, I want to open up a dedicated boutique fitness studio that only has spin. and. Are you interested? I know nothing about spin. I would love it to be, I would love you to be the face of the business and have it um, be all about your method and the way you teach and what do you think? And I mean, within a nanosecond, I was like, I'm in. Um, it was a dream of mine. I didn't have the, the um, capital to fund it. She did. And um, so that was in the fall. And then eventually, Julie, who was also a writer in my class, uh, was always interested in opening a spin business. And she and I used to talk about it all the time, but neither one of us had the, mon the money to do it. So I am a very loyal person. And I felt bad that it was Elizabeth and I, and there was Julie. So I introduced Julie to Elizabeth, thinking she'd be a great third partner. And they hit it, hit it off. And in answer to your question, um, we started really formulating our, our ideas in probably December. Mm -hmm. And we opened our doors in April of 2006, wow. so, so not fast. that long. Yeah. Yeah. And then it built momentum, and then there was a dissolution of partnership. Correct. And you still taught there for a couple of years after, mm -hmm. and then you were approached by two other writers. Yes. And then Flywheel was kind of born, which I'm yes. very happy about. <laughs> Thank <laughs> Love you. Love Flywheel. <laughs> so how did that, you know, leaving SoulCycle to go found a competitor, how did that happen? So uh, with the way things went down at SoulCycle, I was very ready to leave. And um, I met, as you said, one of my future co-founders who was in my class, <clears throat> excuse me, the other one, didn't, he never took class, no. <laughs> but he was his partner. They were both in private equity. And basically, they saw this business in SoulCycle and saw the you know throngs of people coming in and sat and crunched the numbers one day and said, it's real business, and wanted to get in on it. And so Jay, one of them, um, he is the one that came up with the idea of attaching a little computer screen to all the bikes where you can be accountable, where you could know where your resistance should be, what your speed should be. And they found me and presented this idea to me. And 
Initially, I was a little dubious because I thought, you know, so much of my ride was about riding, closing your eyes, going inside, tapping into what was going on, tapping into the song on the playlist, a memory, whatever it was. And I thought, well, now if we have numbers, I don't know, it's distracting, and then we can't really do the mind thing. And so I wasn't really sure. And they said, well, just just try it. Go into a room by yourself with the bike and, and see what you think. And that's what I did. And within 15 minutes, I was like, this is genius. And um, the other thing that was so exciting about it was it just became such an obvious differentiator between what was to become Flywheel and SoulCycle. So here we were starting second in the market, but it was such a different product that I absolutely knew there would be room for it. So how was it trying to, I guess, change your teaching method because SoulCycle is so different than yes. Flywheel. Mm -hmm. um, was it more difficult when you had to add in metrics and teach by numbers and did that affect how you taught it all? It definitely changed the class that I had started at SoulCycle, but I was able to still incorporate some mind-body connection stuff um, with the metrics and I so quickly realized that it was such a game changer in terms of as I said, being accountable. And then what happened was I started seeing the results in people's bodies, in their um, joy and gratification that they, they got from this kind of class with these kind of um, real-time results. And so I was a fan, you know, from the get-go. I read an article that said the difference between people that ride at SoulCycle and Flywheel are that um, Flywheel people are masochist. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Interesting. <laughs> I know some masochists. Like <laughs> it's just I feel like it's very Type A. You know, it's very it absolutely is. You have yes. a leaderboard. It's, it's very definitely why I'm a huge fan of it. <laughs> um, so, how do you pick your playlist? Is it just like your mood, or is it based on the numbers we get in class, or how do you decide? It's so instinctual. Um, music always has always been a really huge part of my life, especially being a dancer. Um, growing up, you know, I don't know, music was my escape. I had a kind of very difficult mother, which I talk about in the book. And uh, when things got tough, I would go in my room and listen to music. And I ended up really learning a lot about all different kinds of genres of music um, through my father and the music that was always played in my household growing up and dancing, obviously. And so making the playlist was such a huge part of my enjoyment in what I do. It's just, I spend an enormous amount of time making my playlists, too much time, um, but I love it. And so, very mood driven. Um, I would typically make a playlist for my class the night before, and then I would wake up in the morning and leave myself time because I would completely change it the next morning. So again, way too much time spent on it, but it ended up, you know, bringing very successful playlists that people really liked. and. Um, making them eclectic was really important too, so hopefully there was something for everyone in the class. <clears throat> so now you ha then you had Flywheel, and you and David and Jay were cranking along, and it started to become successful. Mm -hmm. And then Lou Frankfurt became a Series B investor. Yeah. And Series C, actually. Series C, yes. oh, okay. Um, how did that change the dynamics of when it was the startup? to then kind of becoming a bigger brand. How did that change? Did it change how you taught or the dynamics of the relationships within that you had with the instructors mm -hmm. or in general? Because I know when Google, obviously I've heard people talk about when they were here before it became public, the difference in the culture mm -hmm. than when you become this giant company, which Flywheel now is. Yes, huge change. Um, Lou initially became a strategic investor, Series C. Um, and when that happened, the change wasn't felt that obviously because we were all there, David and Jay were there, and we were still, Lou had input on decisions, but we were still making most of the decisions. It wasn't until 2014 when Lou and his family acquired the business that things really changed. So, you know, within the first two months, my two co founders were out, and that in itself was a huge adjustment for me. And um, 
it changed, just the culture changed drastically. It, you know, suddenly, I mean, my original office that I shared with Jay was an electrical closet. And um, I mean, we couldn't even back up our chairs without hitting each other, but it didn't matter. We didn't care. Um, and then this happened, um, the company was acquired and suddenly we're in offices that are a city block long and the whole culture changed in that it just became much more corporate. So I suddenly was in this environment where I didn't even understand the language. It was kind of like, um, I'd be at a meeting and they'd ask us to turn in our, um, hold on, our strategic operative initiatives. And I'd be like, what? Like, I had no idea what they were talking about. And then someone whispered to me, it just means what's your plan? And then I thought, well, why don't they say that? Like I didn't, it was just such a shock for me. And, um, and it was a real growing experience, um, which we talked about too. So what, um, what was it like, I guess, when, after Lou took over, you did talk about in the book that, it, I'm trying to frame this correctly, um, not that you were trying to be forced into a different position, but the expectations of what your role were to be had changed. Yes. And where you really enjoyed teaching, you were now kind of pushing this business role, and that didn't really make you happy. Correct. Um, I found the whole... I found all the changes to be intimidating because it was just so out of my comfort zone. And right from the get-go, um, Lou kind of wanted to mold me in a very different way. And suddenly, my days were spent in meetings after meetings and a lot of talking and you know ideas, but but ideas that weren't necessarily being executed. But we would just keep having more meetings and. I went into this business exactly for the exact reason that I didn't want to be sitting in a meeting all day. And so it just became really difficult. And um, I just stood up one day and I said, this isn't working for me. And I had no idea how they were going to react, but clearly they needed me. So they were open to what I had to say. And um, through that process, I really ended up going back to what I did best, which was being in charge of everything that went on in the in the four walls of the studio, and you know, training instructors, teaching classes, um, being back in charge of the method, and kind of all things creative, and that's that was my happy place. So I did through a series of events get back there. So the other kind of focus on the book that I really liked was you again talked about a lot of personal things, the relationship that you had with. Your mother and your father, that was kind of a triangle. Mm -hmm. This triangle theme I notice a lot in the book. Mm -hmm. So it goes from your mother to your father, then with your husband and Philippe, mm -hmm. then Julie and Elizabeth, then yep. David and Jay. Keep going. And then, <laughs> and then your twin daughters. Yes. <laughs> it never <laughs> ends. <laughs> Is this, yeah. um, have you noticed this a lot? Like in when you're attracted to certain situations, if there's some kind of trio that happens? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, that is what happens. And, um, you know, as I also talk about in the book, I started therapy a long time ago um, when I was 35, and I'm 60. I'll be 61 in March. Um, so I, I've had a lot of years in, in terms of learning about myself. And I certainly am more aware than ever of the triangles and really hope I don't have any more. I <laughs> really hope so. <laughs> what, um, what I really enjoyed is you um, definitely were not, you were not afraid to talk about uncomfortable things and how you reinvented yourself and it, really how at any age you can do that. If you're, hap you're unhappy with something, you can change it. And if you're passionate about something, if you follow that, things will just kind of fall into place, which I felt like happened a lot with you. Um, do you have any advice for other entrepreneurs who are looking to start a business? I do. I think, you know, we all want to do that now. We all want to be entrepreneurs and come up with the next great idea. And, you know, this concept of finding your passion is is spoken about a lot. And I th I always like to tell people that, you just don't sit down one day and find your passion. It, um, 
and sometimes it comes to you when you least expect it. And after I gave up dancing, which had been my passion my whole life, starting from age eight, I never in a million years thought I would ever be passionate about something else. And the reason why I found spin was really because um, through a lot of years, I just tried to be open to all kinds of experiences. And a lot of those experiences were negative and didn't work for me. You know, I tried to work in an office at, uh, as an office manager at a catering company because I was interested in food. I did that after I gave up dancing because I had no idea what I was going to do. And you know what? I hated it. And I learned that I don't want to sit at a desk. So that was informative. Um, after I, as I was going through the trauma of my divorce, I, um, that's when I found spinning. And I decided one day again to just head into that kind of intimidating feeling spin room at the gym I belong to um, after several weeks of walking back and forth and should I or shouldn't I and one day I don't know something in me said oh just go in there and try it and I did and that was when I found spinning but there was a lot in between and so I just think it's important to have faith and know that you will find it and uh, it might not happen when you expect it to. So you recently left Flywheel. I did, very <laughs> which, recently. Yeah, which I saw in December. Mm -hmm. What um, are you most excited to get into next, or is it just kind of open-ended? <sighs> Big breath. Um, <laughs> so I'm in my non-compete period now, so I can't really talk about what's next. Um, and I don't know definitively what it is. I'm trying to, right now my process is about having actually lots of meetings with different kinds of people and um, figuring out what people want, what people still desire. You know, we're in this age of everything going digital, obviously, and um, people working out by themselves in their home, which is really kind of the opposite of, of what I've always done. And so I'm um, getting, you know, a lot of, gathering a lot of information about, you know, how much is of a desire is there still for the group experience and working out together and building a community, um, you know, studying trends right now and, and letting that kind of help me get to that next decision. So I really don't know yet, but um, it will be in fitness, of course, because that's what I do best. And uh, we'll see. It's exciting. Um, touching on that a little bit about working out at home, um, I read in the book that the um, owner or the person that kind of invented Peloton yes. approached you guys about partnering. He did. And was it Lou that didn't want to go for it? It was. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like Mr. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> he specifically said, if we're going to get into that business, we'll do it ourselves. Um, and that's, that was his belief. So... Do, what, what are your feelings on the working out alone, you know, having the interactive class as opposed to being in the room? I mean, I know how I feel about it. But. Yeah. <laughs> um, look, I feel like, obviously, it was a great opportunity for John. And um, he's done incredibly well. The company's yeah. valued at $4 billion, I think, at this point. Now they're adding treading. I just saw They have a treadmill yeah. component yeah. as well. So... Um, Obviously, there's a market for it and a need for it. Um, I still firmly believe that there are enough people out there who want the group experience. And truthfully, so much of the success of both SoulCycle and Flywheel was the building of this exceptional community. And the community obviously consists of people sharing in this experience together. And personally, and I could be wrong, I just feel that in this day and age of so much disconnection and working out alone or being on our phones all day, I, I, I feel like human connection will never really go out of style. And I think it's always a need, an innate need for us. And I feel for that reason, there will always be a market and uh, enough people out there who want to kind of go back to that. And I feel that I'm just going to say it. I feel like in this um, huge expansion that occurred for Flywheel and SoulCycle, I think a lot of that got lost, a lot of the community and that high-touch customer service. And so I kind of feel like there is a need to bring it back. And I do think that things go in full circles. So I'm thinking a lot about that. Yeah. 
I definitely think that there's a lot more energy that you get when you're physically in the class mm -hmm. than working out at home. I just, personally for me, if, if I'm more accountable when I have people around me, then it's just me by myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a great instructor also motivates you when you're physically looking at them and they call out your name like we talked about. Mm -hmm. It motivates you to push even more, to really, really get in the uncomfortable place. Um, right, because it's the connection you have with the instructor. Yeah, and you yeah. will go very far for that one instructor. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's yeah. amazing. It's amazing that um, I feel your brand or brands, because Soul Cycle is like that. I know really popular instructors or classes will book up the second that it opens, and people will pay extra to have the early bookings for yes. that reason. And um, I feel like Flywheel is just a different kind of experience. Um, and I, um, it's more motivating to me when I have a really good instructor that keeps me accountable physically in class than I would by myself at home. I agree. Yeah. Get it. Yeah. So on to some fun stuff now. Um, in the book, you talk about you know, being able to travel more after your children were older and you guys have a trips that you take together mm -hmm. and how much you love to eat, which is also why you enjoy, you know, working out so much. What has been kind of your, obviously I'm really into food. We talked about this as well. <laughs> <laughs> what has been your most favorite kind of a food experience? Hmm. Um, I mean, I'm not sure there was a a specific one, but because my partner and I were both equally into eating good food, literally every business trip we would take, the first thing we would do is check out the best restaurants in, in whatever city we went to. So, so it was great. So I had great dining experiences in every city I went to. Um, yeah, I mean, the whole premise of Flywheel, because of he and I, was all about working hard playing hard and we were never about deprivation or you know cut out this cut out that from your diet it was all about kind of eating whatever you want drinking and just working out hard on the flywheel bike the next day being accountable and that was our mantra so yeah so it was just I mean it was one of the reasons why traveling was so much fun is because yeah. we got to experience so many different kinds of restaurants um, when you guys are, when you were part of Flywheel still and you were looking for instructors, was there some kind of personality trait or like what struck you about who you wanted to bring in to teach? We certainly hired instructors who like to work hard and um, motivate that way by being, as we said, um, aspirational. That was our word when we were looking for an instructor. They had to be aspirational, whether it was um, because of their own physical prowess or um, a certain X factor that was so important, that is so important in every instructor. And that was actually a part of the personality that was really hard to train. They kind of either had to have it or they weren't hireable. So again, some dynamic in their personality that could draw a rider in, you know, on top of their physical strength. Um, now, I know that Flywheel recently, maybe in the past couple of years, added, um, I think it was previously called Flybeats, now it's called Tempo. Mm -hmm. And that is similar-ish to SoulCycle, but mm -hmm. it just has a little more resistance than SoulCycle does. Um, was there, is that kind of the reason you added that in for people who were more drawn to that kind of method, but also wanted the metrics to go with it? So that was a really interesting learning lesson. And the reason is, yes, we decided to add it because it was more about a rhythm ride, which is how the Soul Cycle ride is based. And we thought, well, we should add it, and then we can cast our net wider and hopefully draw on some of those riders who specifically like that kind of ride. Um, what I realized in retrospect was I kind of regretted it because I feel like do what you do well and, and really represent the um, specialness of your product and your ride. And don't feel that you have to get everyone. There, there are enough people out there, you know, especially in big urban cities, New York, obviously. Um, there are enough people out there to fill your rooms. And why not just really stick to what you do best? And um, 
and it just, yeah, it started to kind of dilute the product. And I wasn't really crazy about the idea, to be honest with you. How did you decide which locations you would add it in to try it out? Just the bigger cities? or Our initial uh, way of identifying locations was just open next to a Whole Foods. <laughs> it really was. That was our formula, open next to a Whole Foods. And it always worked. <laughs> um, we did... Uh, mostly choose urban areas. We did, however, um, what we would do is we'd find an urban area, a spot next to a Whole Foods, and then um, we would open in a suburb close to the, air, the initial um, studio so that we could farm out our instructors and they could actually teach at both locations and it was a great way to utilize our instructor team. So we did add suburban locations as well. They, there were exceptions, but um, they, some did really well, some didn't. Um, we just found the formula of, we found it much safer to open in urban areas um, more than suburban areas. And um, I think that in urban, for some reason in sub suburban areas, even if they were wealthy areas, people didn't want to spend money as much as they do in, in the city. And that was an interesting uh, learning experience as well. I was just going to say when we, I just thought of this when we opened in Scarsdale, for example, you know, I didn't think about the fact that, and I learned this from our Scarsdale riders. Um, they would say to me, "We don't want to pay New York prices. That's why we moved to Scarsdale." And it was like, <laughs> "Oh, that makes sense." Um, so they would complain all the time. <laughs> <laughs> what um, What has been your most favorite experience that you've been able to do because of? flywheel or in soul cycle like something that you were like wow I can't believe this is happening writing the book yeah I never in a million years thought I would ever be an author but ironically and this kind of is consistent with staying open to things um, when I was going through I went through my divorce and I was really a fish out of water I had no idea what I was going to do with my life and I decided to take a course in memoir writing really? completely randomly. Um, I knew that I always liked to write, but just thought, oh, that'll be fun. And so it's, I never again in a million years thought I would ever write a book or a memoir, but it was just, maybe that was foreshadowing. I don't know. Well, thank you so much for coming. You're welcome. Thank you for Literally having me. been such, such a great time talking with you today. I'm going to open it up for questions now. If people want to walk up to the microphones. Thank you so much for coming. Huge Thank fly you. fan. Big fan Yay. of Jen Haight. Um, <laughs> I'd love to hear more about the relationship dynamics of your co-founders at SoulCycle, because it sounds like you were approached by one and then had brought the other one in, and then sort of you wound up out of the mix and having uh, founded a startup where we had a co-founder breakup um, over time. I'm just interested to learn, like, how did you, what were the things that you were, what went wrong, and sort of what were the things you were looking for the next time when you started at the flywheel, and maybe even moving on now, like what are some of the things that are top of mind as you think about your next venture? Mm -hmm. Great question. I have to be a little careful about what exactly happened uh, on that day at SoulCycle, but um, in retrospect, I've really learned a lot about the dynamic that the three of us had and the mistakes that were made on my part. And it's been such a growing experience for me, learning through these mistakes and as I talk about in the book, um, and as Charity so aptly pointed out, the whole triangle thing, um, which started with my parents, um, really was replicated in that business partnership. Um, and I ended up being comfortable in a role that unfortunately was comfortable for me, which was a role of kind of taking the back seat, kind of being overpowered, being um, what felt like bullied, um, and quite frankly, not being strong enough at various points of the of my time at Soul Cycle, not being strong enough to stand up for myself, and um, ultimately, it worked against me and. Um, I certainly had a lot of learning experiences to bring to my next partnership at Flywheel that was drastically different. Um, so as I talk about that question in the book, it's, it's really about 
self-awareness and doing the work to get to know yourself, however that plays, however that work plays out, and not repeating patterns and not making the same mistakes. Hi there. Hi. Uh, another huge fan. You got me through like my pregnancy and recovery <laughs> and the last eight That's years. Awesome. I just thank you, thank you, thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, I travel a lot for work and I oftentimes find myself booking hotels that are closer to flywheel locations <laughs> because I know that even in the change of my routine, I still get the experience I want in cardio and you still feel like New York and the energy you need for the day. Um, can you talk a little bit about how the expansion strategy worked with also making sure that you had the same culture and energy and type of trainers? They do differ a bit, <laughs> location to yes. location, um, but how you keep the consistency of the brand with such a massive expansion. So I'm not going to lie, it's, and you actually just pointed it out, when, when the expansion got to a certain point and it was really big, it was hard, it's hard to maintain the culture. And up until a certain point, um, we were able to maintain it. And I really feel like that change happened um, when we were taken over and when we were acquired. At that point, we had 22 studios, which is still a lot. Um, and I always say this, it's not rocket science. My partner and I, Jay, um, our third partner kind of stayed in the background and did more uh, real estate and finance. But Jay and I were in the forefront and I was the face and Jay was in operations and really ran the business. And as simple as this sounds, Jay and I were both are both very nice people. And um, we have, unfortunately, we both had this quality where we really need to be liked by everybody, which is not always a really great quality, but we both had it. And so there's such a trickle down phenomenon that happens from the top. And as a result, we just amassed this amazing group of people. And it also had a lot to do with how we treated our employees. And we, we considered our employees to be as important as our customers. And it didn't matter what your role was. It didn't matter if you were mopping floors or you were a senior VP. Um, everybody was treated the same. And I think that because of that, we just ended up, you know, really great, nice, wonderful people gravitated to us and wanted to work with us. And, and that's why we would always call it the Fly Family, the Fly Fam, because we all really felt like a family. But no question, as we expanded and the expan expansion continued, that's what I talked about before, where um, that specialness kind of, you know, was compromised. I also love studying all things fitness trends. So Love that you're into that as well. <laughs> what are some of the studios or concepts or things that you're really looking at that are doing it right right now? And as you're thinking about your future, what insights do you think you'd want to take from them? So it's interesting because when I hear about other successful boutique fitness uh, businesses, we were talking about Rumble, for example. The ones that I hear a lot of excitement about are, again, the ones where people are, are gravitating toward the community. And so I've heard that a lot about Rumble. And um, there was actually a really interesting article, I don't know if you guys saw it, that came out recently in Vox. And she, the writer talked about um, this concept of expansion and how um, she talks a lot about Flywheel and SoulCycle and um, talked about her opinion was that they kind of lost their focus and identity. And she spent a lot of time talking about boutique and how the smaller studios that are coming up now are actually doing better and people are going back to that. And so I found that really interesting in terms of trends and things going full circle. But... Um, I hear a lot about Rumble. Um, boxing seems to really be take, taking on. Um, I do feel that you know things have changed so much since the days of Soul Cycle starting and Flywheel starting. Um, and I'm about to lose my train of thought. Um, I know. And so, what's been happening again? The whole full circle thing is a lot of these boutique 
businesses that started boutique, started out as boutique, have now expanded their modalities. And um, you know, a flywheel or a soul cycle started adding a lot of different kinds of classes. And now we see a lot of these studios with five different offerings. And and in a sense, that feels to me like, oh, so the the what started out as a, as a very dedicated boutique business has now actually morphed into the big box gym, which is how we started in the first place. So if I were to start again, um, spoiler alert, um, and I don't, you know, I haven't committed to anything, but I think that if I did start a brick and, if I did do another brick and mortar, it would never be about one offering, which is what it could be about initially. But I'd probably have two, and that would be it. I wouldn't want to make it any bigger than that. And um, as I said before, I think that the community aspect and the connecting with people is never going to fall out of favor. Thank you. You're welcome. Article, too. What's that? I read the Vox article. Right? I thought, I thought it was interesting. Yeah. And it made me look really good, so I liked it. Hi. <laughs> Hi. First of all, thank you for making an Android app finally. That was awesome. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I have two questions. One is, what is your personal fitness routine? Are you still spinning? Do you teach? And my second question is, um, there's a lot of new trends in terms of virtual reality, where bikes are actually moving in the rooms, or music videos. Do you think those are all gimmicks, or are they actually uh, contributing something to the experience? So it's hard to answer that without my own personal uh, opinion I you know for myself I they do seem gimmicky to me it's just my opinion um, I you know I le as I said I left flywheel December 31st but up until December 31st I was teaching six to seven classes a week um, I can't ever imagine not teaching it's just what I do and I love it and it never gets old. And as I was saying to Charity, I've been teaching on a, I've been on a bike for 21 years. Um, sadly, I hate to even talk about this, but I am uh, nursing a back injury right now. So a lower back injury. So for the first time in 20, 21 years, I'm off the bike and I'm not doing anything except going to physical therapy. So um, it'll be interesting to see if anything changes being off the bike, I mean, I think one of the reasons why I've been such an advocate for spinning is that it's actually so safe and it's low impact and people can do it at any age. And, you know, so whatever's going on in my back, you know, maybe it's a overuse and just long term kind of situation. Hopefully it'll get better soon. But at the same time, I am an advocate to mixing it up and not just doing doing one modality. Um, I was doing SLT for a while and I, I enjoyed that. It's so challenging. Um, and then of late, I've been incorporating Pilates into my routine because I think Pilates is so challenging but really effective. I wanted to ask about the book, which is your newest baby. And what I'm fascinated by is obviously you, you've left an amazing legacy, but also as a businesswoman who's done very well, as you were thinking about the book and all the many things you can write about, and I'm sure you had an eye on kind of the business aspect of what is the most interesting, how do you get the most viewers and readers and whatnot, mm -hmm. how did you decide what to cover in the book and what to emphasize on and how to position it? The beginning, um, sorry, the genesis of the book really happened by me just sitting down and starting to write personal anecdotes. That's how I started it. Um, I worked with a collaborator because I really didn't know how to start and she posed that to me. She said, what about sitting down and writing 10 stories um, that come to mind? Uh, through the course of your life. And, and so that's how I started. And so it really started, I think, from a personal place. And then I was quickly able to draw lessons from personal experiences, lessons that I learned in life, and, and then applied them to business. So that's kind of how that theme happened. And it really, you know, came the whole idea to do it that way just happened really organically and really easily and again it made it was very consistent with me because I am all about not being afraid of sharing personal stories and that's how I connect with people so it just made sense. So it was more organic versus like a market research. Absolutely time. much more organic which again made sense for me since no business experience. 
And I know we have another question. I just want to say you look amazing. Thank I'm, I'm you. Gonna, I'm, I'm going to start spinning. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say I was a little disappointed because usually it comes out in my talks that I'm 60 and it usually gets a huge response. And all <laughs> you guys were like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> are there any more questions? Oh, here we are. Um, I'm also nursing an injury and I'm a big time runner. So I said, oh, I'm sorry. How terrible that and disruptive is Ugh, your life. I'm the worst. also doing Pilates and PT, so <laughs> I understand. But um, I wanted to like learn a little bit more about the marketing aspect of the Flywheel brand. Um, I'm in ad sales here at Google, and I always think it's interesting, especially in a super competitive environment like fitness, especially mm -hmm. with the like rise of social media and just all of the community aspects of it. But how do you still make paid advertising and, and paid marketing really work for your brand and mm -hmm. actually drive results. So I'd love to hear more about that. Sure, so um, we never advertised ever. Um, this business, so word of mouth um, that we never needed to, things have changed now. Um, and it's interesting, uh, marketing and branding, when we, I remember specifically when we started Flywheel, we really had no idea what our brand was gonna look like. And people would say, well, what's your brand? And my partner and I would say, I don't, we don't know. Um, and we just started the business and the brand came to us and you know, through kind of trial and error and it was just a way to figure out who we were. And then we actually hired a marketing team to work with us about a year in and they were the ones who came up with the idea of Never Coast, and I we love that. And so that really became a game changer for us, and that was something we could really um, hang on to and build a marketing plan from. Yeah. Hi, um, Hi. I have a question about like the pricing and mm -hmm. how you came up with that, because SoulCycle, uh, to me, seems like one of the first kind of boutique or the most well-known early boutique places. And like I was wondering how you guys came up with like the pricing strategy and having no memberships and stuff like this at a gym. And then if you like, if it was like a conscious decision to change your mind when going to um, Flywheel, I'm just basically wondering like, how did you know that people were gonna wanna pay like this type of money to do a boutique fitness class? Cause it doesn't really seem like people were doing that before. Purely ripped it off from SoulCycle. <laughs> we did. I mean, we just used, looked at their model um, as to how they priced and replicated it. We knew that they were getting it because the business was booming at that point when I left. And, um, and so that's how we did it. However, over time, we changed um, our, our um, strategy because they became... In, through their pricing even more elitist and we really wanted to move away from that. I mean, they offered their super soul for $70 for a 45 minute spin class and we could, that just wasn't us, it wasn't our identity and we really wanted to um, build a business that was about inclusiveness and soul cycle to us seemed like a business that was about exclusiveness so that, um, was very um, important in how we went about our pricing. I personally was not in charge of the, that part of the business, so I can't speak with too much detail about it, but um, I know that the membership idea really took off for us and, was, and people loved the membership because they could really get in a lot of classes for a lot less money. Well, thank you. You're welcome. What I do love is that you give the spin shoes for free rental, whereas Soul Cycle, I think it was like three or four dollars. Yeah, and so water. Don't... Yeah, and for water yeah, as well. yeah, which is great because you don't have to bring anything with you, which is amazing. And that was another way in which we started the business and figured out things was obviously I was coming from Soul Cycle, and so what better way than for me to look back on Soul Cycle and, and know what worked and what didn't work, and the things that worked we we kept and the things that didn't work we changed and one of the things I knew from the rider experience was they would come to take class and then oh they'd have to take out their wallet again to pay for water or take out their wallet to pay for shoes and they really kind of resented it so that was just one example of how we thought we're going to do away with that. And one last good, question. A good last question. So we have a spin studio on the 14th floor. I saw it. Once your back gets back in order, what are the chances you come and teach us? 
I was actually thinking about that. I really was. We can help organize. <laughs> I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do it. Yay. Woohoo. I'm wondering, um, no, I'm actually wondering if like that would interfere with my non-compete, but I mean, come on. Don't tell <laughs> anyone. Don't tell anybody. Okay. <laughs> yeah, separate. that'll work. Because I never got to take your class. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to do it. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> um, Ruth will be upstairs to sign books after. So if everyone wants to queue upstairs, she'll be signing things and you can buy the book. And thank you so much for coming. You're welcome. It's such a pleasure meeting you. Thank you.